I want to share three stories with you this evening of people who I've met over the years at the congregation. All except for the last one, I've changed the stories a bit so that they'd hopefully be unrecognizable because two of them are still living. But they're real people, and um, I've known them personally. So first I want to start with Jane. Jane, throughout her life, never quite fit the mold of wherever she was. If she was in elementary school, it didn't quite work. High school didn't work. College didn't work. Her circle of friends, she was kind of lost. She, she was in Wise Elementary School for a while. She ended up in public school. She never quite made it to become a bat mitzvah. And by high school, she fell in with a, a crowd she probably shouldn't have spent her time with. Um, parents, her parents kept on her. They, they hired tutors. They did what Jewish parents do. They got her therapy. Um, she even attended a special out-of-bounds program in Utah. And she managed to at least gain admission to Pierce College. But from that point forward, a series of poor choices caused her to spiral just downhill. She was in the car, it turns out, when her boyfriend robbed a house. And when the police caught up with them, they also found meth, methamphetamines in the car. So she was subsequently charged with burglary and uh, possessing illegal drugs. Her parents did what good Jewish parents do. They secured a good lawyer. So she received probation on the condition that she attended treatment programs for her drug addiction. And of course, life unfortunately went through ups and downs. I wish it had a happy ending, but it, it doesn't quite. And there were slip-ups and run-ins with the police, and her parents had to provide a combination of tough love when she needed structure and unconditional support when she made the right choices. So over the years, there were a series of odd jobs, low-paying, minimum wage. She dropped out of college, finally, um, until she found her way to Beit Chuva. And there she found a, a bit of redemption, and she was able to get on her feet more stably. She spent a couple of years at Beit Chuva, and she seems to have gotten it together, and she's back at Valley College, and fortunately she's holding a, a low wage but steady job. That's the first story. The second story is about Phil. When he was in elementary school, he was recognized right off the bat as a child with some, some problems. He was prone to angry outbursts, and he didn't quite find his place in whatever school his parents put him in until they finally found Westmark. And they were able to enroll him in Westmark, and that environment was the right one for him and helped him control some of his outbursts and learn to basically do what he needed to do to get along with his peers reasonably well. Fortunately, he did become a bar mitzvah at Wise. Unfortunately, he too fell into a round of drug abuse and had to attend a residential treatment facility while he was still in high school. He managed to get clean for a year um, until recently, once again, he was busted for using serious drugs and he's back into treatment and his family continues to support him. He's still a minor. He also goes to Beit Shuva, con coincidentally. His family goes with him to services. Um, he's by no means in the clear. So now here's, here's the third. Um, and this one is relatively straight to this person's life because he is no longer alive. Um, for years, Bob sat right there in the congregation. For years he was there. Some of you might even remember him. He was, um, had a slight, I think, intellectual impairment. His speech was slow. But to talk to Bob was to talk to a sweet and kind and gentle man who was always, always had something nice to say to each of us and always came up after services to say Shabbat Shalom. And he loved coming to temple, and we all, the rabbis, got to know him over the years. Bob didn't really have a job that supported him, and at some point he actually trained to be a lay counselor and visit people in hospitals, and he did. He volunteered his time in hospitals around the city, and he was a sweet, warm, comforting, kind presence to people he visited. Um, at some point, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and he went through years of treatment, progress setbacks, progress setbacks, until he died. Um, Rabbi Hersher actually officiated at Bob's funeral, and each of us, um, sadly but with honor, went to lead a shiva minion at his family's home for Bob after he died. So what is it that connects these three people who some of us know and I've certainly known? It's that each of them have had 
challenges in their lives that were not for the support of their family, were it not for the environment that they were living in, they probably would have been the people living on the streets of Los Angeles. They probably would have been the streets of people, the faces of people living in Los Angeles. Because these three could have been the faces of the homeless people that surround us. Now the public face of homelessness is often that disheveled man blocking our way into the drugstore or panhandling outside the grocery store. But there are 44,000 homeless people in L.A. County. 44,000. Most of them are invisible to us. They live in cars. They sleep on the couches of friends and relatives if they're lucky. They sleep under the freeway underpasses. Or they sleep in countless abandoned homes and buildings around the city. So each of the people I described could have been one of them, were it not for the families that supported them. And you probably could add your own stories of people who have a family member who wasn't quite able to cut it, but because of the support of family, they're not living on the streets. But what if that person that you know or that I described didn't have family? What if they didn't have the resources of loved ones surrounding them to keep them safe? So what I'm suggesting is to understand the face of homelessness, we actually have to look in the mirror and to know that families of homeless can be our families as well. Because the face of homelessness in Los Angeles are single mothers whose husbands have disappeared or are abusive or have welched on their child support. Young people who've fallen out of the foster care system. Here's a number that's going to absolutely blow you away. There are 56,000 children in foster care in Los Angeles County. At 18, they're pushed out of the system. Done. Kids who've been raised by a variety of adults throughout their lives in group homes who certainly don't have the resources of people to hold them up when they trip, pick them up when they fall, thousands of them go out onto the streets every year. There are 4,000 veterans on our streets. We've gotten about 1,000 of them off. They're single men. Some former felons who can't get employment, some are drug addicted, some are just down on their luck, but there are 44,000 of these people. So when I was singing out to joy with Lahuna Ranana, I was singing out because this week, LA County and the city of LA passed some pretty comprehensive plans to try to address that problem. The county committed $150 million through a combination of government and private partnerships that will be spent on things like coordinating the many programs that exist. A lot of progress has been made. We don't know it because we're not conscious of it in our lives, but over the past several years, um, the Chamber of Commerce got together with the United Way and the city to really coordinate and streamline so many of the problems for our homeless. They strengthen the range of programs that prevent homelessness now in, with this uh, $150 million to increase opportunities for employment and training so the folks who get housed can also get jobs. And they've developed something in Los Angeles which has been successful in Denver and in Salt Lake City and a little bit in New York City. It's called permanent supportive housing. And the notion is put a homeless person into a, a unit, get a roof over that person's head, and then from that place with stability, the other issues, health issues, perhaps mental health, education, can be handled better when they don't have to try to manage life out of their car. So in order to do that, we have to increase the availability of subsidized housing. The county's committed to that, and so is the city. And we're involved with that. We've placed to date almost 45 homeless people in units owned by our congregants. Market rate, not Section 8, not below market, market rate, we've placed homeless people. And through, again, the city, the Chamber of Commerce, a combination, all those owners get market rate rent paid every month for a homeless person that they're now housing. That homeless person is supported by a host of social workers and professionals to support and make sure that that person succeeds and stays in the house. We're increasing affordable housing. You can find the list online. All in all, there are 47. I'm going to spare you all of them. So the LA City Council did a similar thing, and that is online as well. And if these things are implemented, we should take a big dent out of the problem that faces our city. Maybe you saw the front page article on Wednesday that touted this major initiative. Maybe you missed it. But what I'm suggesting, and the reason I'm standing here, and the reason I wrote the article last week in The Wise Guide, and the reason you're going to hear a lot about it, is because the Jewish community has to be a part of the solution. We built a lot of this city. 
we need to make sure that we house the folks who can't find housing. Now, one and foremost, first and foremost, because we live here. So we're citizens of this city. So that's the first reason to worry about it. But the second reason, I believe, it's because it's our calling as Jews. Someone tried to get my blood to boil this week, and they sent me an email that challenged that second point about it being a Jewish calling. Somebody's circulated an article on the internet, and they said it to me and said, what do you think? And the article is one by someone who says the tikkun olam is an authentic Jewish idea, that it was invented in the 50s. So I'm not going to give it the benefit of repeating it, but I'm going to respond to it this way. If tikkun olam, repairing the world, isn't a Jewish value, then, because it's too new, then neither is worship in synagogues. Because at one point, that was new. It was an invention after the temple was destroyed. If tikkun olam isn't a Jewish value because it's too new, then we shouldn't have women rabbis and cantors, because after all, that's new. That's only 50 years old. And if tikkun olam isn't a Jewish value, then we shouldn't really support Israel. Because there was no notion of a Jewish state before the Zionists invented a Jewish state in Basel, Switzerland in 1897. By Jewish chronology, that's pretty new. The Israeli flag, that's a new invention too. But we all feel pretty moved when we see that flag waving in the breeze and sing Hatikva or sing the prayer for the state of Israel. Pretty new. But Israel is certainly a Jewish value as well. Oh, and your Passover Seder? It's not mentioned in the Torah either. That's a Jewish invention and innovation. That was invented by the rabbis, this is rather old, 1,800 years ago. So my point is, over the span of 3,000 years, there have been many new and innovative ideas in Judaism. That's why we're still here. If it was always the same, then it would never modify itself for the new generation. So here's my litmus test. You know what makes something a Jewish value? If Jews create it, and then Jews do it. If it becomes a part of Jewish practice and it's meaningful Jewish practice, then it's a Jewish value. And Jews developed the idea of tikkun olam and they drew from the words of the prophets and they drew from the words of the prayer book and they drew from the principles in Torah. And they created what I think is no more a Jewish notion than any of the others I've mentioned which are clearly Jewish, no less a Jewish notion I should say, than the other values that I mentioned. So that's why I have the quote on my talit because tikkun olam is a Jewish value. That's Isaiah. Then your light will burst forth like the dawn, and your long lives will flourish. So what's Isaiah saying? He repeated, the, he said those words that we read as our prayer for America. He said, care for your poor, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, bring them into your home, he had the audacity to say. And if you do that, then the sun will rise on you. Then the light will shine on you. Then, like the dawn and the new sun that comes up each morning, your long lives will be illuminated by the light of hope and redemption. That's what Isaiah said. And that's why tikkun olam is rooted firmly in Jewish tradition. The faces of the homeless are ours. Homeless children are ours. Homeless mothers are are our sisters, and homeless men are our brothers. This city is our city. This country, it's our country. And it's finally on a path to remedy, remedy a scar that cuts through it like the highways that we all use when they're moving and sit in when they're not. And it's incumbent upon us as Jews to realize that deeply Jewish value of tikkun olam and make sure that as many as possible of those 44,000 homeless are no longer living on the streets. Amen.